Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and welcome back to our Hanafi Fiqh class. We are doing the kitab known as A'ala Sunan of Mulana Zafar Ahmad Thanvi, rahimahullah. We are still dealing with the chapter of Tahara, specifically the nullifiers of wudu. And in our last class, we had entered into the chapter with regards to touching the private part, not uh, being a nullifier of wudu. And it is from that point that we are continuing on from tonight, inshallah. So without any delay, let's begin. بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه. So we are here from hadith number 134 on page 191 of volume 1. So he starts, he says, عن الحسن أن خمسة من أصحاب محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم who are they? علي بن أبي طالب وابن مسعود وحذيفة وعمران بن حسين ورجل آخر. قال بعضهم ما أبالي مسست ذكري أو أرنبتي وقال الآخر فخذي وقال الآخر ركبتي رواه الطبراني في الكبير ورجاله رجال الصحيح إلا أن الحسن مدلس ولم يصرح بالسماع قلت لا ضير فإن مراسيل الحسن صحاح قاله أبو زرعة وابن المديني كما في التدريب الراوي so he starts and he begins by saying Imam Al-Hassan Rahimahullah reports that five of the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum uh, who are these five? Adrat Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyallahu anhu, Adrat Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu anhu, Adrat Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman radiyallahu anhu, and Adrat Imran ibn Hussein radiyallahu anhu, and the fifth one's name is not mentioned here. But anyway, I'll touch on this a moment later. But okay, let me mention it anyway. There, it's not only just five. This narration makes mention of five, but there are more. For example, Adrat Abu Darda radiyallahu anhu, Adrat Abdullah ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhu, ma and others as well were all of the same opinion which is what and this is now the of the five that he had quoted they had made the following statement that ma ubali masastu dhakari aw arnabati and this in fact was the statement of Adri ali radiyallahu anhu specifically uh, others had made the same thing but anyway they said there's no difference to me whether i touch my a private organ or my nose and the other one said I, there's no difference between whether i touch my private organ or i touch my thigh the other one said no difference between touching my private organ or touching my knee in other words showing that like each part of the body your nose your knee your thigh likewise is your private part it does not affect your wudu in any way he says Imam al tabarani reports this hadith in his al muajim al kabir and the narrators are all authentic except that the uh, narrated here Al-Hassan, Imam Al-Hassan, he says he's a Mutallis. And here he has not explicitly stated that he heard it from so-and-so. So therefore, you know, it's like there's some weakness in the chain. But Mulana Zafar Ahmad Thanvi says, La dair, there's no harm in this because, because the marasil of Imam Al-Hassan are regarded as being authentic. This is, has been stated by Imam Abu Zura'a Al-Razi and Imam Ali ibn al-Madini, Rahimahumallah, both great famous imams of Jarh wa Ta'adil. So if the imams of the science say that your mursal narrations are authentic, then to come and say the narration is mursal, you know, it, it's moot because the ones who put down the terms like mursal and everything, they said, if you could narrate a mursal one because you are so reliable and authentic, the mursal narrations you report are authentic. So, you know, it's like, saying six or half a dozen, it makes really no difference at the end of the day. So that's how it goes with regards to this one. But there are a number of ahadith still to come, so let's move on to the next one. So on the next page, number 135. <laughs> طبعة منك نجسة فاقطعها وهذا سند صحيح أخرجه ابن أبي شيبة كذا في الجوهر النقي It's, it's reported by Imam Waqi of uh, Ibn al-Jarrah from Ismail ibn Ismail from Imam Qais who said that a man asked Hadrat Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas رضي الله عنه with regards to the ruling of touching a person's private part you know what happens uh, does your wudu break or what 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 so Hadrat Sa'ad رضي الله عنه replied by saying if you know that a portion of your body is impure, it's najis, then cut it off. In other words, you saw the same statement two weeks back when we touched, or last week at least, uh, when we touched on this chapter, Hadrat Ali radiallahu anhu and other sahab radiallahu anhu as well, making the same sort of statement, that no part of your body, as in the organ itself, is najis. So therefore, it, they weren't telling you, go out and, uh, you know, chop your parts off. They were saying that, you know, 
there's nothing of you that's impure. So really, whether you touch your arm or your head or your private part, like your head, touching your head doesn't break your wudu, likewise, that touching your private part not break your wudu as well. This is an authentic chain of narration. It's reported by Imam Ibn Abi Shayba, rahimahullah, in his Musannaf, and this is how it's mentioned in Al Jawhar al Naqi. Okay, so anyway, that was the. Yeah, I jumped the page. Okay, so here we were on the page that we had just done. Let's move on further because there's still took quite a bit to go on this chapter. Moving on to the next narration, he says, "أخبرنا أبو العوام البصري قال سأل رجل عطاء ابن بي رباح قال يا أبا محمد رجل مسا فرجه بعد ما توضأ قال رجل من القوم إن ابن عباس رضي الله عنه ما كان يقول إن كنت تستنجسه فقطعه قال عطاء ابن بي رباح هذا والله قول ابن عباس أخرجه محمد في موطئه قلت سند صحيح وأبو العوام هو عبد العزيز بن الربيع بالتشديد الباهلي البصري ثقة من السابعة رواع عن عطاء وابن الزبير قال ابن معين ابن معين ثقة وذكره ابن حبان في الثقات كذا في تعليق الممجد نقلا عن التقريب والتهذيب so anyway, chain of narration over here. Abu Al-Awwam al-Basri, he said that a man asked Imam Ata ibn Abi, ibn Abi Rabah. Now Imam Ata ibn Abi Rabah was an, uh, a student, one of the major students of Hadrat Abdullah ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhuma. And by the way, he happens to also uh, find his way as being one of the teachers of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. So anyway, in his halaqa, uh, a person said, and his kunya was Abu Muhammad, so they asked uh, uh, Imam uh, Abdullah, uh, Imam Atta ibn Abi Rabah, that, oh Abu Muhammad, if a man touches his private part after he had made wudu, what's the, the ruling regarding this? So one of the other people was sitting in, in, the, in, the, in the halaqa as well, he said that, Hazrat uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhu used to say, that if you regard your private part as being uh, najis, then cut it off. Is Imam Atta ibn Abi Rabah, upon hearing this, he said, Hada, this, wallah, is the statement of Hadrat Abdullah ibn Abbas. In other words, I myself have heard it already uh, from him as well. So, what I mentioned earlier, uh, there were six Sahaba I mentioned uh, Hadrat Ali ibn Abi Talib, Hadrat Abdullah ibn Zubair, I mean, uh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Hadrat Hudayf ibn al Yaman, uh, Hadrat Abu Darda, Hadrat Abdullah ibn uh, Abbas, Hadrat. Uh, Imran ibn Hussein, radiyallahu anhum, all of them were of the same viewpoint. That in fact, the majority of the Sahaba. And you know, when you're talking about Sahaba, Sahaba were of different levels. There were those who were fuqaha and those who were not from amongst the fuqaha of the Sahaba. And if you look at the names that were quoted, all of them are from fuqaha of the Sahaba. The only of the fuqaha of the Sahaba, in fact, of the Sahaba really, uh, of note that differed with this is Hadrat Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma. He held the view of the hadith of Hadrat Busra radiallahu anha, which is that if you touch your private part, you must make wudu. Now, I'll add one additional point here, which is not mentioned uh, as far as what we have read, but we touched on a point before where, you know, when we were doing the chapter with regards to eating meat cooked over fire, and you found a hadith which we had mentioned a similar, you know, that al-wudu'u mima masatin nar, wudu is required for oh, things that were cooked over fire. And what I made mention back then is that some of the fuqaha, how they interpreted the hadith is that the word wudu is not only used for wudu as we know it, wudu is also used for washing hands. So you found, for example, from Hadrat uh, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiyallahu anhu as well, who had taken the, you know, that if you attach your private part, wash your hand. Don't, it doesn't mean make wudu. So, you know, you've got different, different interpretations. But by and large, the majority of the Sahaba, the fuqaha of the Sahaba as well, uh, like I say, with the exception, exception of Hadrat Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Hadrat Abdullah ibn Umar radiyallahu anhu, by and large, everyone else was of the view, viewpoint that touching your private part, does not break your wudu. And we did narrate the hadith uh, from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to that effect, but just showing also that, you know, I spoke about this, I think, last week, but in fact, I've been speaking about it a couple of times on online, offline, uh, you know, social media things, so I can't recall, did I mention it last week in the class or not? But when you're talking about the sources of sharia, you know, people talk Quran and hadith, Quran and hadith, Quran and hadith, Quran and hadith is not 
you know, uh, let me put it this way, the way people use it is not on par with what it should be. Why? Because you have a hadith which is abrogated. So we say Quran and Sunnah, and Sunnah is uh, preserved through who? The Sahaba radiallahu anhum. So when you have the Sahaba radiallahu anhum almost unanimous on a point like this here, then if you are wanting to know what is really in Quran and Hadith, really in Quran and Sunnah, you'd look into the lives and the opinions of the fuqaha of the Sahaba. That's how you will know what the Sunnah actually is. In fact, just earlier today on Facebook, there was somebody, standard old thing, you know, Salafis hold the opinion that uh, men and women make a salah the same. And they use as their proof, uh, perform salah the way you have seen me perform salah. But this is a hadith taken totally out of context in a modernist uh, interpretation, never held before by the ummah. You know, the Sahaba, radiallahu anhu, again, by and large, they all held the viewpoint that men and women do not perform salah the same. All four madhaib, the Hanafi madhab, Shafi'i madhab, Maliki madhab, uh, Hanbali madhab, all hold the viewpoint that men and women do not perform the postures in the same manner. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum, the wives of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they perform their ruku' and sujood differently. Now you find a Salafi and you quote a, a statement of Imam al-Bayhaqi of Imam ibn Hajar al-Asqalani or this Imam or that Imam, making it seem as if they were supporting the Salafi viewpoint. But in reality, they differed with the Salafi viewpoint. They held firmly that men and women do not perform salah in their postures at least the same way. They were muhaddithin. So speaking in the context of uh, hadith, they would look at this particular chain of narration and say, well, in this particular chain, there's a weak narrator. But that doesn't mean that they now, on account of them doing their duty as muhaddithin, that they were suddenly throwing out the baby with the bathwater. So muhaddithin would look at this particular chain, comment on this specific chain and say, in this chain is a weak narrator. Ergo, this narration is weak. In fact, you may even find amongst the fuqaha where there's, for example, the folding of the hands. There's the uh, rukur, there's the sujood, there's the feet in... Uh, uh, you know, these different, different postures. So you may find some fuqaha and they say, no, the narrations with regards to the ruku is not that authentic, for example. So they would hold to the hands and to the feet in, in ka'ada and they would say the, uh, the sujood, that is different, but not maybe the ruku. And that's what they were actually speaking about. But at no point did these a'imma say men and women perform salah the same. And, you know, this is where using a... Uh, critical mind, let me put it this way, comes into play. Because when you look at the Salafis and specifically on this uh, okay, uh, issue, because like I say, it was something that just came up today that I had uh, replied to, but it's uh, when you look at it, they they start and end basically, Albani said, Sallu kamara aytumuni usalli. Albani said so. And that's really as far as the proof goes. Then they go on and they dismiss and they say, you know, others quoted Sahaba and from the Salaf who said that men and women don't perform the Salah the same. And then they say, the Salaf is now that the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa are what to be followed. In other words, you are saying that the Sahaba radiallahu anhum didn't follow the Sunnah. You know, apply your mind correctly and understand what it is that you are actually saying when you say, no, we can't take what Sahaba said. We have to take what we think Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said and meant. While in reality, that's not the case. You are, you know, you look at the Qadianis of today, uh, the followers of Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadian Kafir, and he said, well, uh, you know, there's a Nabi to come. His name is Ahmad. My name is Ahmad. That's me. You know, nonsensical things like this. Shia read the Quran and, uh, you know, uh, they feel they are being referred to. Or Hadrat Ali radiallahu anhu is being referred to in the Quran in ayat, which is not referring to Hadrat Ali radiallahu anhu. You really look at the hadith rejectors and they take the ayah, فَبِأَيِّ حَدِيثٍ بَعْدَهُ يُؤْمِنُونَ Which hadith after this, meaning the Quran, uh, will you believe? And they, they say, look, there, the Quran tells you, so you to reject hadith. It's ignorance on all of their part. And the same uh, is found now in the Salafi when they come along and they say, we must put the Sahaba to the side because Albani said, Sallu kama ra'ayt muni usalli is the, uh, the principal hadith that uh, is to be used in this case, which is not the case. We say, yes, Sallu kama ra'ayt muni usalli is there. It's a principle, but it doesn't apply in this context at all. Otherwise, 
who's Dina you following? You see, the thing is, Aima, the Madhaib, they have a Sanid, a chain of narration from them, unbroken, right up to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But in reality, Salafis do not have chains of narration. Albani, for example, had no chain of narration for Hadith. He read a Hadith himself in a library and proclaimed himself uh, to be a muhaddith. People may not like to hear it, but it is a reality nonetheless. So now what happens is he grades the hadith as being weak or whatever. And, uh, you know, as I always say, for Salafis, the gradings of Albani is like gospel. Apart from uh, uh, some Madkhalis who will now differ with Albani and take uh, Rabi ibn Hadi al Madkhali as their uh, uh, source, but that's basically how it goes. So you need to ask yourself, who was the actual preservers of the Sunnah? Who were the ones who brought the deen to us that it reached us today? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sahaba? Or a Salafi born yesterday? I mean, you ask yourself the question. There's a thousand, two, uh, 1,300 years already between the Sahaba radiallahu anhu to the Salafis of today. So who knew the deen better? Who understood the deen better? Who knew what the Sunnah was? more than those Sahaba radiallahu anhum. So, you know, it, it needs a person to put severe blinkers, you know, to dig your head into the sand to actually accept Salafi viewpoints over the viewpoints of the Madahib. Because the views of the Madahib are firmly entrenched in the Sunnah. And the Salafi viewpoints are based on their reading, their interpretation of what they feel a hadith means, even though the Salaf did not hold those viewpoints. But anyway, I've digressed. Let's come back to the, the narration over here. So uh, Imam Muhammad uh, ibn al-Hassan al-Shaybani rahimahullah reports this hadith in his Muwatta. Now the Muwatta of Imam Muhammad is in fact the Muwatta of Imam Malik. For those who don't know, Imam Malik rahimahullah did not write a Muwatta. He didn't sit there and write down, write down, write down a hadith. No, Imam Malik used to narrate a hadith and he had a different uh, amount of students that he would learn by him at a particular time. So at one point in time, one particular student Amongst all the many others, he wrote down the Ahadith Imam Malik would narrate. And thus, you find multiple versions of the Muwatta of Imam Malik. Because if you really think that those few, and I say few because in reality, in the greater scheme of things, it's a few Ahadith. Those few Ahadith that are contained in uh, the Muwatta of Imam Malik, if you think that's all the Ahadith Imam Malik knew, then you'd be sorely mistaken. Imam Bukhari, rahimahullah, knew hundreds of thousands of Ahadith. And yet there's barely 7,000 and something ahadith in Bukhari, and that's with the additions, uh, you know, the repetitions. So, you know, Muhadithi knew a lot more ahadith, even though they narrated a certain a percentage of it, because many times it was different chains. But in any case, uh, be that this in May, so different uh, students of Imam Malik had taken the Muatta from him. And one of those students was Imam Muhammad ibn al-Hassan al-Shaybani. After Imam Abu Hanif rahimahullah passed away, Imam Muhammad had taken the Muatta from Imam Malik. But what made this one different and what caused this Muatta to get the name of the Muatta of Imam Muhammad as opposed to, to the Muatta of Imam Malik is that the other students simply wrote down the ahadith as Imam Malik had narrated it and left it at that. But Imam Muhammad had written the ahadith that he heard from Imam Malik, and then he would add on to it. And he would say, for example, uh, Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah reported the, this to us, meaning when the hadith that Imam Malik narrated differed to the practice of Imam Abu Hanifa, then he would quote that this is the reason why we follow this, because Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah reported this from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's how it goes. Thus, the his kitab came to be known as the Muwatta of Imam Muhammad. But in any case, this hadith is found in that kitab. So Ma'ana Zafar Ahmad Thami says that the sonar of this hadith is authentic. Uh, Abu al-Awwam, his name is Abdul Aziz ibn al-Rubayyi' not Rabi'i, but Rubayyi' al-Bahili al-Basri. He's thiqa and he, it's narrated from Imam Ata uh, and uh, Abu Zubair and Imam Ibn Ma, uh, Yahya Ibn Ma'in said that he is thiqa and Imam Ibn Hibban rahimahullah has reported listed him as being amongst the thiqat. Imam Ibn Hibban has his kitab known as al-thiqat one of the, when you're doing the science of jarh wa ta'adil, uh, al-thiqat of Imam Ibn Hibban is a must have it's not something that you can overlook, you know uh, uh, that you can put to the side. When you are wanting to know what is the status, uh, status of a particular narrator, one of the first sources you'd be looking at is a thiqat of Imam Ibn Hibban. Very nice kitab, but anyway, so you'd look up the narrator's name inside there. Oh, okay, Imam Ibn Hibban. If he's found in a thiqat, it means Imam Ibn Hibban has regarded him as being authentic. If he's not in a thiqat, either Imam uh, Ibn Hibban did not know of him, 
or Imam Ibn Hibban did not regard him as authentic, in which case you'd find him in Imam Ibn Hibban's kitab where he lists the weak narrators. But be that this is me, so Imam Ibn Hibban regards him as being thiqa as well. And he says, this is how it's mentioned in At-Taliq al-Mumajjad, which comes from At-Taqrib wa tahdeeb Let's move on further before too many, much time passes by and we lose the remainder of the class. I was hoping we would get uh, the, to the end of the chapter, but let's see how we go. So we on hadith number 137. Akhbarana Abu Hanifa, Nu'man ibn Thabit, rahimahullah, an Hamad, عن حماد يعني ابن أبي سليمان عن إبراهيم النخعي عن علي بن أبي طالب رضي الله عنه في مس الذكر قال ما أبالي مسسته أو طرف أنفي أخرجه محمد في الموطة وهو مرسل صحيح ثم وصله عن مسعر بن كدام حدثنا قابوس عن أبي ذبيان عن علي إلى آخره ورجاله ثقات <تصفيق> So this narration is reported from Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, from his teacher Imam Hamad ibn Abi Sulaiman, the most famous and primary teacher of Imam Abu Hanifa, who reports it from who? Imam Ibrahim al nakhai rahimahullah, who reports it from who? Hadrat Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyallahu anhu. Now, before I go further, I want to point out one uh, thing over here. You see, when you are doing hadith and you're doing a proper study of hadith and you are doing jarh al-ta'adil, if you were to look at this chain of narration here, what is the problem? Is there a, a, what issue strikes you in this chain of narration? We know Imam Abu Hanifa, great uh, Imam of uh, hadith and fiqh and everything. We know Imam Hamadi uh, uh, Ibn Abi Sulaiman, great Imam. You know, when you actually want to know who is Imam uh, Hamad Ibn Abi Sulaiman, when Imam Zahabi, uh, uh, rahimahullah, he said, the greatest of the fuqaha or that inhabited uh, Kufa was Hadrat Ali radiyallahu anhu and Hadrat Abdullah Ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu anhu. And their greatest student was Imam Al-Qama. And the, his greatest student was Imam Ibrahim al nakhai And his greatest student was Imam Hamad ibn Abi Sulaiman. And his greatest student was Imam Abu Hanifa. And his greatest student was Imam Abu Yusuf. And his greatest student was Imam Muhammad ibn al-Hassan al-Shaybani. And the greatest student of Imam uh, Muhammad ibn al-Hassan al-Shaybani was Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah. That's how knowledge went from generation to generation. So, you know, we're talking big names in this chain here. But there's one thing that, you know, if you look simply, you see, you, uh, what I'm speaking about here, I'm pointing out a point of charh wa ta'adil. If you look, Imam Abu Hanifa, siqa, reliable. Imam Hamad, siqa, reliable. Imam Ibrahim al nakhai siqa, reliable. Hazir Ali radiyallahu anhu, sahabi, beyond, uh, uh, you know, charh, uh, don't apply to sahaba. All of the sahaba, kulluhum adul. All of them are trustworthy and reliable. So if you look, authentic, authentic, authentic sahabi. So there's no issue. So it should be, but there's one issue, which is a non-issue, but I'm going to point out for you anyway. Hadrat Ali radiallahu anhu passed away in the year 40 after Hijrah. Imam Ibrahim al nakhai rahimahullah was born in the year 47 after Hijrah. In other words, Imam Ibrahim al nakhai rahimahullah is not narrating it directly from Hadrat Ali radiallahu anhu. He's reporting it from someone who's reporting it from Hadr Ali radiallahu anhu. So on first glance, if you were to not know your rijal, the narrators of the hadith, you may look upon this and you say, but it's 100% authentic. Everybody's a reliable narrator. But some muhadithin would come and they say, well, there's some weakness in it. Why? They would say on account of the fact that it is mursal. That is why you say, you see, uh, okay, let me just read and I'll come to here. So the Hadr Ali radiallahu anhu was asked with regards to touching the private part. And he said, I uh, see no difference between touching the private part or touching the tip of my nose. Imam Muhammad rahimahullah reports this in his muwatta and it is a mursal sahih narration. But anyway, he says, it's also reported in a Mosul, in meaning in, in a, a, a full chain without a being any irsal, which is from Misa'ad ibn Kidam, from Qabus, from Abu Zibyan, from Hazrat Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. Uh, okay, question over here. Is this why it says akhbarana instead of hadathana? No. Akhbarana, uh, I, you know, it's one of the common uh, things I always point out, but uh, no harm in always pointing it out again. Hadathana would mean that the, uh, the Imam Abu Hanifa read it, or at least uh, Imam Abu Hanifa narrated to us. Akhbarana means that I read it to Imam Abu Hanifa, and Imam Abu Hanifa confirmed it. 
that's what akhbarana is so hadathana akhbarana and anbaana the different terms are used depending on like i explained i think just last week that when you hear these terms you come to know the circumstances around the uh, hadith itself so when we read akhbarana we know that imam uh, muhammad rahimahullah was the one who was reading the hadith at the time in the circle of imam abu hanifa whereas if he had said hadathana we would know that imam abu hanifa rahimahullah as the head of the class uh, or at least the teacher of the class was narrating to his students but the, the, as is the way of muhaddithin the teacher would read sometimes the student would read and the teacher would confirm it and had it said amba ana we would have known that for example maybe uh, let's say imam uh, hasan ibn hasan ibn ziyad al lului maybe he was uh, uh, reading and imam uh, muhammad was just present in the class hence he's using the term ambaana so that's why these different terms play a role in the understanding of a hadith but anyway so i was saying it is a mursal sahih but it's also reported with a full chain which comes through this chain here from qabus from hadr uh, from abu dhabian from hadr ali ibn abi talib radiyallahu anhu and all of the chain all the narrators in this chain is authentic hence there's no issue with the hadith and mursalun sahih it is a sahih mursal narration now why is this I made mention of this as well i think just last week but you know it since everything always tends to come back to the same point I always tend to repeat myself but anyway so when we talking about early islam early fuqaha and muhaddithin they were of the viewpoint that mursal narrations are regarded as being authentic people about that is why you find both the uh, two uh, first madhahib uh, imam abu hanif and imam malik rahimahum allah both of them accepted mursal narration so to did the other imam of the time imam sufyan al-thawri rahimahum allah from mistaken and others who were all of the same generation all of them accepted a mursal narration as being fine and acceptable and reliable and authentic it was it was when imam uh, al-shafi'i rahimahum allah came along that uh, mursal now got Uh, uh, given a, a, the description as being weak the reason why the early imma uh, of the viewpoint that mursal is authentic is because imam ibrahim al nakhai was one of the big tabi'in he was a student of hadr anas ibn malik radiyallahu anhu and many other sahaba radiyallahu anhum so you know when you having a, a, an imam who heard directly from sahaba who who teaches well from the greats you know the who never reported from weak uh, narrators like this so if he narrates uh, like this then we have no issue accepting it because if he left somebody's name out it would have been a reliable person anyway so therefore because of the abundance of authentic reliable people in the early generation so the early fuqaha and muhaddithin said a mursal narration is not a problem but by the time imam shafi'i and remember imam shafi'i rahimahullah was born in the year 150 after hijra that is when he was only born generations had already passed by look at imam abu hanifa who passed away in 150 and he's got imam hamad uh, uh, ibn abi sulaiman who heard from imam ibrahim al nakhai who heard from somebody else who heard from hadr ali radiyallahu anhu and that's from an imam who passed away before imam shafi'i rahimahullah was born so you obviously by the time imam shafi'i rahimahullah came into the picture there was more people more liars and type like this around that is why by the time imam bukhari rahimahullah came along there were much more narrators around you know much more people so more uh, because imam bukhari came uh, imam ahmad came uh, and studied under imam shafi'i imam bukhari came and after imam ahmad so you know you've got generations going down the line so obviously the latter uh, uh, fuqaha and muhaddithin they changed their viewpoint towards mursal narrations but for us who follow the, the initial uh, fuqaha and muhaddithin we are following their chains where they had no issue with it so that imam bukhari comes along and he find he finds with his chain a hadith which imam bukhari happened to imam, imam abu hanifa for example happened to narrate the same thing but imam abu hanifa didn't report it with the chain that imam bukhari narrates it with so therefore if imam abu hanifa regarded it as being authentic and imam bukhari says it's not authentic the grading of imam bukhari falls actually to the wayside because he is commenting on the chain of narration that he had whereas imam abu hanifa uh, graded it as being authentic based on his chain that he had so you know many people tend to get the wrong end of the stick and they think that imam bukhari hasn't reported it it's not authentic if it's not in bukhari or muslim it's not authentic it doesn't work that way so you know in reality the hadith itself is 100% authentic but like he says 
the Mursal form alone is sufficient, but it's also reported in a Musnad form, which in, as it says here now, uh, in a Mosul, Wasal, a joint form, that there's nobody missing. So both ways, there's no issue with this chain of narration. Our time is running short. Let me just see uh, three more narrations now. We won't be able to uh, manage all three before the one, two, three. Yeah, no, too much to do uh, uh, tonight because with nine minutes only left and knowing the, the speed that I uh, tend to uh, speak at, I probably only do another one more before our time runs out. But let's do one more anyway. Uh, so, نمبر 138 أخبرنا سلام بن سليم عن منصور ابن المعتمر عن السدوسي عن البراء بن قيس قال سألت حذيفة من اليمان رضي الله عنه عن الرجل ما ذكره فقال إنما هو كمسه رأس كمسه رأسه رأسه أخرجه محمد في المواقع وسنده صحيح والسدوسي هو إياد بن لقيط كما صرح به الطحاوي في روايته عن حذيفة هذا الحديث وهو ثقة وثقه ابن معين والنساء وغيرهما كذا في التعليق المماجد so, uh, Once again, Imam Muhammad narrates from Salam ibn Salim, from Mansur ibn Mu'atamir, from uh, Imam al-Sadusi who narrates from Al-Bara ibn Qais who said that, that I asked Hadrat Hudayf ibn al-Yaman عنه, with regards to a man who touches his private part. So, Hadrat Hudayf said, it's the same as if he had touched his head. In other words, like you did, and I did mention this earlier, whether you touch your arm or your head or your leg or your, your any other part of your body, it doesn't affect your wudu. So likewise, touching the, your private part doesn't affect your wudu. Imam Muhammad Rahimullah reports this hadith in his muwatta, and the chain of narration is authentic. Imam al sadusi his name is Iyad ibn Laqid. Imam al tahawi in his kitab, he reports, and he mentions the whole name, Iyad ibn Laqid al sadusi and... Uh, with the same hadith of Hadrat Hudayfa, so it's not like it's some other person by the name of Iyad ibn Laqid. Now, with regards to Iyad ibn Laqid, he's regarded as being thiqa. He's created thiqa by who? Imam Yahya ibn Ma'in. Now, for those who don't know Imam Yahya ibn Ma'in, uh, in not last year, but the year before, what last year, you know, last year's uh, Ramadan series, which was titled the Ahnaf series, we touched on the life of. Uh, Briefly, the life of Imam Yahya ibn Ma'in. So if you did go to the Darul Ilm channel on YouTube and you go to the Ahnaf series uh, on there, at least I hope, I think I've uploaded the whole uh, series, but I'm uh, unsure. But anyway, if not, if it's not on there, you can always message me on WhatsApp. I'll send you the link that way. But uh, that's Imam Yahya ibn Ma'in. And uh, if you don't know Imam Nasai, in the two years prior to that, we had done the Knowing the Ulama series also. And briefly touched on the life of Imam al-Nasai. So if you know who these are imma of hadith were, then if they created a person as being reliable, who's there to find fault with them? And like I made mention before, when you know we've got the six famous books of hadith, Bukhari, Muslim, Tirmidhi, Abu Dawud, Nasai, and Ibn Majah, and I made mention of this two weeks ago, I think, uh, that Imam Bukhari's uh, kitab, as far as authenticity levels are concerned, Imam Bukhari's uh, 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 gradings are of the highest amongst these six are imma. So Imam Bukhari, then Imam Muslim, then Imam al Nasai. So when you've got the Sunan, which is Nasai, Ibn Majah, Abu Dawud, and Tirmidhi, Nasai is actually number one amongst them. The, uh, based on how do these gradings come about uh, of being levels? It comes about on account of the amount of narrations that are regarded as being authentic versus the, so to say, uh, chains which happen to have some weak narrators within them. So Imam, and Imam Bukhari, not that Imam Muslim has any weak uh, narrators in there at all, but that Imam Bukhari had a certain criteria and Imam Muslim's criteria, criteria was slightly less than that of Imam Bukhari. You know, I did touch upon this point once upon a time, whether it was in this series or the Mustalah al-Hadith series before in the past. But anyway, so each of the imma had a certain criteria. If the, for example, uh, in, in between Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim, rahimahumallah, just to point out one uh, thing, uh, if a narrator, le, uh, Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim, the way they differ, if, let's say, for example, I narrate from, uh, let's say, let's say I narrate from Mufti Brandi Sai. For example, so Imam Bukhari will ask, "Did I? Uh, what is the you know like proof that I met Imam uh, Mufti Brandi Sai?" Imam Muslim would say, "Well, you know, uh, we lived in the same time, we lived even in the same country, so it's quite likely I could have met him." So therefore, Imam Bukhari would say, "You know, 
if, unless it's proven that I met him, he won't take my narration. But Imam Muslim would say, well, it's quite likely you could have heard from him, so he would take it. So that's how they differed. And the other Aima all had their own different criteria like this between them. And that is why he, uh, the different ranks came accordingly like this. But anyway, I spoken, taken up too much of your time for the night. And uh, anyway, we'll end on this point here itself. Uh, the, it, uh, so Imam Iyad ibn Laqib al Sadusi is graded authentic by Imam Yahya ibn Ma'in and Imam uh, al Nasai and others as well, like it's mentioned in Al Ta'aliq al Mumajjad. And that's the end of the 138th uh, hadith of this uh, kitab. And we will stop on this point here, inshallah. I haven't received any questions during the course of this uh, class. Like I always say, you're always welcome to ask your questions at any point in time. You don't have to wait until the end, but so be it. Uh, that being that, I'll give it, it, since we do happen to have three minutes left, if anybody did want to ask any questions, you're welcome to ask your questions now. Okay, question, do you have a science of hadith series on YouTube? Yes, actually I do. Only thing is, you're not gonna find it now on the, the Darul Ilm channel on YouTube, but you're gonna go to YouTube and you search for the Umma Radio channel. Because when I was doing the classes on Umma Radio, I did the whole kitab, Muqaddimatun Fi Usul Al Hadith of Mulana Abdul Haq al Dihlawi Rahimahullah, which is the kitab which is done in the Darul Ulooms uh, when doing Mustalah al Hadith. So you can go there uh, to, like I say, go to YouTube, type in Umma Radio channel. Uh, you'll see the uh, online based UK radio station like this, you'll find a playlist over there called Mustalah al-Hadith series, uh, or Mustalah al-Hadith uh, at least anyway, and in that you'll find about 28 or 30 something uh, classes Obviously, during the time of the radio, the classes were longer because I didn't have limitations like Zoom has. But anyway, so you'll find it over there, uh, the full from the beginning of the kitab of Muqaddimatun Fi Usul al Hadith until the end of it, which, like I say, was roughly, roughly around 30 classes for the sum total of the kitab. So there's a, the, it's beginner science of hadith, obviously not be as detailed as what we are doing here right now, but so be it. Okay, question uh, which has come in, uh, not related to the topic, but we need an answer. Can a woman lead in salah, for example, the taraweeh salah at home in jama'ah, loud salah? Okay, as far as the Hanafi madhab is concerned, a woman, uh, it is makru tahrimi to her, for women to have their own jama'ah. So at no point in time should women ever perform their salah in jama'ah with themselves. The other uh, madhahib, they do have a, a scope for it. And they say now, for example, the woman would not, the the woman who's leading the other women, the Shafi'i madhahib now, for example, they have scope for it. So they would say the woman who leads them will stand in like the middle of the front saf and she would lead them like that. But the Hanafi madhahib say no. Uh, it is makru tahrimi for women to have their own jama'ah, regardless of what salah it is, whether it be for nafil salah, or the uh, fard salah, or the taraweeh salah, which is sunnah now, regardless of what it is, it is makru tahrimi. And makru tahrimi is a term used by the uh, uh, fuqaha but to denote something being impermissible. We forgot only, we've got less than a minute left, so a couple of seconds only, but anyway, let me end uh, on this here. Uh, are there, are there any narrations on how Ummahatul Mu'mineen prayed Salah? Uh, depending on what you mean, did they do it in Jama'ah or on their own? That, yes, you will find different narrations regarding that. Obviously, I'm unable to even narrate one because we've got now about less than 30 seconds. We've got 20 seconds only left on the clock uh, before the time will run out. But uh, so being it, uh, if you do want to have more information, you're welcome to send me a message on WhatsApp and I will answer it inshallah. But our time is just about out. So we end on this point here. Until next time, wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad. Subhanallahi wa bihamdihi. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdik. Nashiru wa la ilaha illa anta. 